Hello and welcome back to our bookshop here in Tring. Uh, firstly, a quick word of thanks to all of you who've been uh, supporting the shop so much in the last couple of weeks. It's been uh, it's been incredible, actually. We've been so busy. So thank you to all of you. Now, this is our second author interview. And um, this time around, it features the rather brilliant Beth Murray and her book, Saving Missy. Uh, now, Kim, one of our team here, is going to interview her. She is... Um, a massive fan of this book and uh, so based on her enthusiasm we all then looked at it and uh, and I totally agreed with her and uh, we're totally totally overwhelmed by the uh, rather wonderful little marketing campaign look at the dog biscuits which were supplied uh, by Harper Collins as part of the campaign for this book so um, clearly they believe in it as well so guys do enjoy the book uh, I would finally add that um, we're making our first book club book, so we're, uh, we've been toying with the idea of a book club, and finally this is the book we've chosen. So please, um, if you get involved and, uh, and read it, then and come and join one of our Zoom meetings um, in, in, in a few weeks' time. But uh, without further ado, can I uh, welcome Beth Murray and Kim Baden. Okay, thank you, Ben. Um, Beth, really warm welcome to our bookshop in Tring. It's really lovely to see you. Um, I just want to tell people how I ended up making contact with you if, if that if that's okay so um, I, I work in the bookshop part-time I retired from my school my school job back in September and and just ended up working here three days a week and um, what I love most about it is when our customers come in and I can make recommendations about books for them so while we've been closed down I've been on a bit of a mission to read as many books as I possibly can and um, for those customers of ours who are watching this, they'll remember seeing this in the shop, um, <laughs> along with your book, uh, just January time, I, I, I guess. Um, and it was one of the books that I thought I would pick up and, and, and read, because it was just intriguing that there were dog biscuits on our shelf. <laughs> um, and I picked up your book, and... I started reading it and I read it and I read it and I couldn't put it down and I read it in about three sessions and I just loved it so much and that's when I contacted you by email and, and said how much I'd enjoyed it and then we got into a little bit of a, an email conversation and, and you very kindly agreed to come along and, and talk to me about your fantastic debut novel, novel um, Saving Missy. So this is where we are, so welcome to Tree. Um, I wonder, Beth, if you don't mind, could you just tell us a little bit about you and how you became a, a best-selling novelist? That sounds like a really weird sentence to say. I, can't, I still can't get used to that. Um, I've wanted to write a novel since I was six years old. Um, and I wrote a story about Icarus at school and everybody else finished after a page and I just carried on and on and on. Um, and I couldn't stop. And I had a kind of feeling that I was doing the thing that I really liked most of all out of anything. Um, and it developed into this feeling that I really wanted, just looking behind you, all those spines of books, I really wanted to go into a bookshop and one of the spines be mine. So while I loved writing, the thing that drove me was specifically that I wanted the physical book to hold. Um, and I tried to write a book several times. Um, I started in my early 20s. I wrote a spin-off of, from Mary Poppins about Winifred Banks. Um, it was kind of a weird book. <laughs> I didn't get very far. Um, I was a bit too young to have anything to say, I think. Um, and then I tried to write a book about TV because I worked in TV. Um, and again, it was a bit unwieldy and I wasn't quite ready. And then when I was on maternity leave with my second son, um, my husband suggested we put him in nursery two days a week so I could have another go. Um, and this time I just think maybe I was ready. Um, and I had an idea about a book I wanted to write about a very lonely old woman who is saved by a dog and some friends. Um, and I just went for it. And, and how, yeah. uh, tell us a little bit about, um, or t tell us a little bit about the, the plot. You said it's about an old lady that, that you decided to write about. Tell, tell us just a little bit about her life without giving too much away, Beth, because I've obviously... No spoilers, no spoilers. So here you go, there's, <laughs> there's my beautiful cover. Um, so Saving Missy is about a very defensive, prickly and lonely old lady 
who lives on her own in a huge house in Stoke Newington. Um, and she's kind of faded out of society. Um, she's mourning her husband, uh, her beloved son and grandson have moved to the other side of the world. And she's kind of estranged in a weird way from her daughter. Um, and one day she goes to the park and she meets two women who offer her a different kind of life, a sort of second chance. Um, and we see her sort of tentatively through this adoption of a dog, Bobby, kind of feel her way back into society and form friendships and build a new life for herself. But at the same time, she's held back by all the mistakes and secrets of her past. So the question is, can she hold on to this new happiness or is she going to get dragged back down again? And, and did somebody inspire you to write that? So is it is it based on somebody that you know or did is it just somebody that came into your imagination? It was loads and loads of things gradually, like layer upon layer of thoughts and ideas. Um, I wanted to write about loneliness because uh, not in my second maternity leave, but my first, I was very lonely. Um, and, I and I wanted to kind of explore that complexity of loneliness because I was completely surrounded by people, but I just felt very isolated and confused. So I wanted to kind of explore those feelings, how you can be uh, either on your own and perfectly happy or surrounded by people but very miserable and uh, I thought because I'm a dog owner how funny it was that everybody in the park I know because of my dog um, a wide variety of people and it struck me that if you got somebody who was lonely then that's that simple addition of a dog could make all the difference though it's not really about the dog it's not a doggy novel it's just I needed one thing to give her that would change her life. So it could have been anything, it could have been a hobby or something, but it was the dog. Um, and the reason I fixed on Missy as a character was because I wanted to feature a scene that I had in mind, which was a party in 1956 where Sylvia Plath met, met Ted Hughes. And it's a famous literary party. And I'd had the idea, what if another couple who were very different met on the same night? like it was kind of an electric charge around this night, everybody falling in love at the same time. Um, and so I'd had this idea, but then I realized that if I was going to have my protagonist fall in love in 1956, then in 2016, she'd be nearly 80. Um, and so I thought, well, actually that could be interesting. Um, so I've got an old lady as my protagonist. Um, and then I guess the biggest inspiration for Missy, I, I don't know somebody like Missy particularly, um, but the biggest inspiration was I was fascinated by the character of Barbara Covert from Notes on a Scandal. Um, I just loved that character, just so compelling. And I'd had this idea, what if you could create a Barbara Covert who was nice, who could be redeemed and pulled back? And so the main inspiration was a kind of waspish, prickly Barbara Covert character who could be redeemed. And, and I think that for me reading it, there was... Um uh a lot of similarities with with my mum because she would have been around about that age and that was a, a really good insight into um how the things that happen throughout your life still have a really profound effect when you're you're elderly and you think you know as a young person you think that actually by the time you you're you're older you're more confident and you don't have too many cares in the world but lots of her secrets just carried on affecting her until she was a very, very elderly lady. Um, I, I love Missy. I love watching her grow into this um, much nicer person, a much nicer person. And, and I also liked your other characters, Beth. Tell, tell us a little bit about some of your other characters. Um, well, I wanted an eclectic mix of people because that strikes me as how dog owner groups get together. We're a diverse bunch. Um, so I always knew I wanted kind of intergenerational friendships. Um, and I'd had this idea of Sylvie's character, uh, who was going to be a kind of very bracing, slightly flippant, but very warm um, feature of her life. And I never planned Angela at all. She just walked in um, and introduced herself to me. Uh, and so I just went with that. Um, and what I liked about Angela's character is her, her being a single mum, she introduces four-year-old Otis, who gives that uh, intergenerational gap and is a 
you know, is a really profound relationship for Missy because she's a, his kind of adoptive grandmother. Um, and then all the kind of subsidiary characters um, are based on my kind of own, our group of, of people in the park where you just seem to know everybody and are always bumping into people, um, which is really nice. And, and but I just want to say a, a kind of warm, disparate, noisy group of people. And, and even though those people right on the periphery, like I really loved Denzel, you just, you just created somebody who was unexpected. So when Missy first met him, she, she was really judgmental and she was a very judgmental woman in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And she judged him as being someone quite different to how he turned out to be. Yeah. It, it was really interesting. And even those, those smaller characters, they were really believable and, and they were real people. I, I really loved that about your book. Um, oh, good, thank you. And, and tell, me about, tell me about Bobby, because I know you've, you've got a dog, you've already alluded to that. Was, was Bobby's character based on your dog? No, um, Bobby is a really uh, affectionate dog. Um, whereas my dog, who is a Labradoodle, is completely aloof and antisocial and uninterested in me. Um, and I follow her around pathetically trying to get a crumb of affection from her, but I get nothing. She, uh, my dog, Polly, is in the book. She makes a very brief appearance um, on the day that Missy uh, votes in the referendum. So Polly does turn up as a cameo appearance, but she bears no resemblance to Bobby. Uh, Bobby, if you're talking about sort of parentage, then I see Bobby as a kind of German Shepherd Collie mix. So she'd have those beautiful kind of golden browns colours, um, but look smaller, a bit like a kind of collie or maybe an Australian shepherd. So she was based on a dog in the park that I see, who my husband and I call the most beautiful dog in the park. Uh, actually has blue eyes um, and is just gorgeous, but also not very friendly. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to know a lot of unfriendly dogs. And, and, and Missy was a, a really reluctant dog owner. It, the dog was kind of foisted upon her, wasn't it? And, and she wasn't yes. ever so keen. Um, can, can you just tell us a little bit about how that relationship developed? And there was, there was a bit at the end of um, chapter 32 after the Christmas party where she was opening her gifts and she talked about the dog being a gift. Mm -hmm. Well, I never wanted Missy, I mean, it, it doesn't suit Missy's character to be a huge dog lover. And I never wanted her to be because that would have meant that the journey of her and Bobby's relationship wouldn't have been nearly as interesting. So it was much more interesting to me that she didn't want Bobby and was hugely reluctant um, to take her on. Um, but I wanted the relationship between them to warm gradually. And it was a bit, for me, like a kind of romance, like falling in love. So I used some of those tropes in the, in the book, this idea that, that Missy is experiencing a kind of falling in love and it's a gradual thing that takes hold. You know, just realizing that she likes the company and she likes the security and then she likes the sociability of who Bobby leads her to. to. Um, and then loving Bobby for, her, for herself. Um, and there was a scene that I wrote initially in an early draft where Missy actually tells Bobby that she loves her um, in a kind of echo of, you know, that, that scene that you might find in a traditional romance, uh, the L word. But um, I can't remember why that scene got cut and it possibly was for the best. But I wanted that moment between them, that moment where Missy realises that she actually does love her. And I guess the Christmas scene kind of replaced that because they, they have a moment together where they're opening presents. And Missy realises that the best present that she got is sitting right in front of her. Um, and that that is her family now. Um, and it's a kind of profound realisation for her that she's finally found that kind of unconditional uncomplicated straightforward love that she's always wanted and and when the book was published in america it was actually called the love story of missy carmichael is that have i got that right what why did yes that, that's why did that change then beth why did the title change well i originally called it the love story of missy carmichael 
And I felt terribly clever for calling it that because of course, once you've read it, you realize that it's not a love story in the traditional sense. It's about all the different forms of love that touch Missy's life. And some of them are inadequate as far as she's concerned. Some of them don't live up to her expectations, but they're still love stories. So there's, there's kind of mother daughter relationships, there's romantic love, um, there's friendships between women, um, and then there's love for a pet. Um, and so I thought, you know, it's a really clever title. But I guess the problem is you might not realise it's a clever title if you're looking at it for the first time in a bookshop. You might think, oh, it's a love story. That sounds a bit mushy. I, I don't want to read that. And so I guess there are kind of, I still love the title, but I guess there are potential flaws and misunderstandings that could arise from seeing it. And so when um, my UK publishers were gearing up for publication, they felt that it was better to have something a bit simpler and more direct. And I think on balance, you know, they could have been right. Yes, and, and, and it is saving Missy, isn't it? She changes from this very, very prickly old lady to someone who's actually quite lovable. And, but she's still got some spiky bits at the end. But she's, so she doesn't change totally, but her, the people she meets really try hard at keeping a lovely relationship. They don't ever give up on her, which is, which is really lovely. And, and they soften the, her edges, but she still, they soften her edges, yes, but she's absolutely. still got edges. Uh, yes, I agree. And the, um, so part of the book is set back in the 1950s and part in the present day. Um, you're obviously too young to remember lots of stuff in the 1950s, although I can remember stuff in the 1960s. Um, did you have to do quite a lot of research to get the the language and the and the feel for being a young person at that time? Yeah, I did a fair amount of research. Um, uh, the thing that had got me interested was um, I went to Newnham College, the same college that Missy goes to, and I'd gone back for an event uh, a few years ago and as part of the event they'd ask people who went to the college right back till the 40s to send in kind of reminiscences of what it was like in college then and they'd laminated them all and laid them out on a table you could read them and I was absolutely fascinated I was there for hours just reading pouring over them taking photos of them I was I just loved it um, because it was the same as my experience but also not the same at all and so I, I used a lot of those reminiscences as part of my research. And I also uh, went back to the Newnham Library and read some of the archives, including accounts of that particular party in 1956, where Missy meets Leo. I went and interviewed my old director of studies, who was at the party, um, and got her to give me all the gossip on it. Um, and then more generally, one of the things I really wanted, which is why I really liked having an older protagonist, I liked the idea of of personal record and public record just brushing against each other now and then. So you get things like the suffragette movement, the introduction of the pill, abortion, um, uh, what else? Uh, there's all sorts of, of, of kind of moments in history, the death penalty, um, that inav inadvertently affect Missy as she's going through life. Um, so whenever I came up against anything, I would have to kind of research it in a bit more detail and find out. So um, there's a scene between Missy and Leo that's set during the Cambridge Garden House riots of the 1970s, yes. which I had no idea about. And I had to read loads of articles and kind of get a sense of how it all worked out. But I really wanted that kind of light reflection of 20th century history. It was a lot of interesting reading. It was really interesting. and and. Tell me a little bit about Leo's character, because Leo kind of sits in the back of the novel the whole time, doesn't he? Even though he's not present as such. So where did you get him from? Uh, he, in my mind, was because, because the echo of Sylvia Plath and Ted Hughes was there. I guess I was thinking of Ted Hughes a bit but a kind of blonde Ted Hughes. That's how I imagine he looks. He's very handsome. Oh yeah, he has to be because he's he's a bit of a sod, really. Um, he's very self-absorbed, quite arrogant, pretty selfish, but he's also great fun and I bet could hold you absolutely wrapped at a dinner party. Um, and 
I wanted that sense that Missy is inextricably tied to him. She just fell in love and, you know, all of us have fallen in love with slightly inappropriate people or people who aren't quite deserving of that love. Um, so he does let her down on occasion, but it, it's a love that does endure. Um, so it does work, the marriage, but I didn't want it to be an easy marriage or a kind of straightforward marriage where they just love each other and that's it. I wanted there to be difficulties in it. And Leo presents that figure, the kind of lion of a man who commands her love. Is he worthy of it? Mm, not really sure. Um, but I wanted, it, I wanted that thorniness to play out. It was quite relatable, wasn't it? That that relationship, that, and, and and particularly at that time, because it was the man who who was the breadwinner, and he was obviously very famous, and lots of people loved him, and and Missy was sort of lost in her little world of mopping up after children, and and at times I think probably feeling quite resentful and bitter about it, and and I think sometimes as mums we probably do feel like that from time to time so that that is quite relatable i think she does feel like she's been pulled back by him held back by him and what's important to note is that missy can more than hold her own with his intellect so you know obviously leo is a very formidably clever intellectual man and a great writer but it's made clear in the book that she is just as clever as he is um, and yet she didn't get the same opportunities. I mean, partly she didn't get the same opportunities because of the time that they, they were in. But equally, and Missy reflects on this herself, she perhaps didn't push for it. Her own mother wouldn't have stood for the way that Missy was treated, and yet Missy does. So, you know, they're both to blame, not just Leo. And, and I loved all the characters in Missy's past as well, how you shone a light on on them and their, their own difficulties. And there was one particular say, scene that I really, really loved was when she was with her mom and she was trying to breastfeed her daughter. Mm. Um, that was just so beautiful. It was so beautifully written. And um, that relationship between mom and daughter, which probably wasn't there all the time, just came together in that moment when they had something that they could really share between them. I, I really liked that little scene. Yeah, um, it's one of my favourites, and it's also one of the last scenes I wrote in the book. Um, oh, really? And I wrote it, um, uh, for some reason, I, I think I was on a deadline, and I was a bit squeezed for time, and I was looking after my youngest son, and he was watching some rubbish on the telly, and he was insisting on me holding his hand, so I had to ha hold his hand and then type it out. And I look back on that and I think, you know, was there something, something parental that was running through me at the time? Yeah. Because it, it felt like a nice scene to write. Yes, possibly. How long did it take you to write the book, Beth? Well, in the initial draft, um, so I, we put our son in nursery two, two days a week and I started in October. And by the end of the year, I'd written about 80,000 words. So it was 80,000 words for the first three months. And then I went back to work and I didn't write anything for three months. Um, so I booked a weekend away and I wrote the last 15,000 words in a weekend. So I had the first draft really quickly, but I spent at least a year after that editing it and going over and over and over. Um, and I tend to write like that, I found, that I write really quickly in a slapdash way. And then afterwards, I start thinking about it and really crafting it. Did you have a plan for the whole book? Did you have the whole story mapped out before you started? No, I had various scenes. I had, when I started it, I had the fish stunning scene at the beginning and the party scene. And I also broadly knew stuff that happened at the end so I kind of had an idea about how it was going to plan out, pan out across the whole book but more than that no I just let it happen um, which is a bit risky really um, and then of course you know you, you end up with timeline issues and continuity issues which you have to resolve but what I also find is if you don't plan too much then you really interesting unexpected organic things can happen and in the past when I've written and I've overplanned, I end up being too stilted and I wanted to give it room to breathe um, so that tends to work quite well for me.
And and did you um how did you feel when you finished it? Did you did you feel a sort of a sense of loss because you weren't immersed in those characters anymore? Um the thing is, as I'm discovering <laughs> when I write book two, um you never really feel like you finished it. So I do remember finishing the fir that first draft. I finished it in cage and I went for a walk. I had a cry and I went for a walk after because I'd never written a book in its entirety before. And it may well have been, you know, as at the time, I think I thought it may well be rubbish, but it is completely and demonstrably a book. It has a beginning, a middle and an end. And it's 90,000 words and I've done it. So I was quite emotional then. But after that, you're never really sure when you finished it you know, because you're rewriting it constantly and it's, I mean, I, I can barely look at it now because I know I'll see sentences that I could improve upon. Um, so it's not so clear cut when you finished, but I think um, that moment where you finish the first draft and it's a total mess uh, and you'd never show it to anyone because it's so dreadful, but that moment is quite nice and and certainly as I get to the end of a first draft, I have terrible winter because I kind of build momentum as I'm going through and you, you get just really buzzy and can't, they won't leave you alone, your characters. And, and how did you feel when you first saw your, your book out there in, in shop? That must have been an amazing feeling. That was incredible. It was so exciting. Um, and... I went to visit it whenever I was near a bookshop. I would go in just to go and have a look at it, see if I could find it. Um, and it was just the most exciting, wonderful feeling um, after all these years actually actually seeing it there. Um, and I, you know, I should say, I feel so utterly terrible for the new, particularly new authors at the moment who haven't had that opportunity that they've got, they've struggled to get their books into the world and they're not getting that great thrill. I mean, people were people were texting me and, and sending me pictures oh I've seen it in Truro oh I'm, I'm in I, I'm in Somerset and I've seen your book in a bookshop and they'd send me pictures and it was so exciting and I so feel for the debut authors now who can't get that opportunity it's just terrible I think I might if it was me I think I might have wanted to go and stroke it for a bit and just give it some love I, love it. It I didn't didn't say much work <laughs> that's so lovely um and you talked just quickly then about a second book H how's that going it's really different circumstances to write in because when I wrote the first book it was just a hobby it was like a whim and nobody really knew I was doing it apart from my husband and certainly no one was particularly interested or had any kind of vested interest so I was just left to my own devices and also I'd had an awful lot of time to think about it, years and years really. Um, so this is very different. Um, and I feel slightly self-conscious when I'm writing, like there are all sorts of people waiting to read it and you know, it's, it's hard, it's been a bit of a slog. Um, I think my editors probably think I'm on about draft five. I'm on a lot more than that. Um, but I've, I've kind of written it, I mean, like that first draft of Missy, it is demonstrably a book. It has a beginning and it has an end. Are you so, able to tell us what it's about? Well, I don't to say too much because I'll, I'll keep changing it <laughs> so it'll bear no resemblance. Uh, but it is about, it's set in the same area of London as Missy. Um, and the world, it's not a sequel in any sense, but the worlds kind of brush very lightly together. And um, it's about a struggling single mum who had really, really big ambitions when she was growing up, but for one reason or another, it's gone very, very wrong. Um, and she finds herself in a very different position to the one that she imagined she would be in. And it's how she tries to turn her life around and have big dreams again. I'm really, really looking forward to it already. <laughs> and just before you go, Beth, just tell us how you're managing with the with life as it is at the moment. Because you've got two small boy, two small boys. Is that right? Yeah. And homeschooling, presumably, at some point. Yes. Um, initially, we all, the four of us, five including the dog, quite liked lockdown. Um, it was different and it was intriguing. 
and you know we were in the lucky position me and my husband can work from home um so it was a bit of an adventure and we both quite got into homeschooling and really trying hard I, i'm not very good at playing i'm quite missy ish in um my attitude to children um, um but i thought you know i'm quite a good homeschool teacher i plan a lot and i'm i'm quite interesting i reckon <laughs> um but it's gradually it's unraveled it, they're feral it's just a battle to stop them watching Mario Kart videos. So, it, it, yeah, we're kind of over it. <laughs> it's hard. You've just got definitely got to get through it and maintain the sense of humour without any doubt whatsoever. I've got quite a six thirty gin habit. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm it's funny to you should say that we we've had to in our in our house because I've got my two grown up children staying with us and. Um, in our house we've all agreed that we're only going to drink friday saturday and sunday but sometimes it slips into thursday <laughs> that is impressive restraint that i i'm yeah. afraid i haven't managed i'm trying to rein it in um and also just eating loads because that's my only reward and baking yeah a lot of baking i'm not yeah. i'm not good at baking but a lot of baking and who's going to eat all those cakes that i keep baking me yes me too. Beth, thank you so much. Um, I just, those, those people that are watching it now, I just want to reiterate again how much I, I so enjoyed Saving Missy. It, it, it touches on so many themes and we, we don't have time to explore them all now, but there are so many things that, that, that you touch on, Beth, and they're uplifting. There's bits of it that are a bit sad. There's bits that really resonate with yourself when you're, when you're feeling a bit lonely or a bit down but the most lovely thing that comes out out of it is that you have this elderly lady who's very dark and very miserable and she gets colored in throughout the book which is something that my sister said um, and I and I told you Beth and, and it is like watching somebody being painted with colors because she changes so much and it's not just about the dog although the dog is a big part of it but it's about how she relates to those people around her who are kind enough to let let her into their world um and it's a beautiful book beth and your debut novel and you must have felt amazing when it became a sunday times bestseller that must have been an incredible it was nice you don't get many moments of uncomplicated joy um, and I was in a swimming room changing room when I found out and had a little cry and then had to disguise it because people would have thought I was weird. I'm sure. And it was also, I think it was the, uh, the Mail Online and it might have been the Independent. I can't remember now because I look, read lots and lots of reviews about your book. Um, but it's one of the books to read during isolation because it is so beautiful and, and, and so uplifting. And, and at our bookshop, um, I think I may have already told you that um, we're going to have it as our first virtual book club book, which is really exciting. Um, and, and more than that, there's loads and loads and loads of things to talk about in it that we haven't even really touched on, like the relationship between Missy and her daughter, the relationship between Missy and her son, um, and, and all those complex and beautiful relationships that, that are weaved throughout the whole book. And, it, and it's lovely, Beth. I love it. I can't wait to read your next book. I'm very excited about it. And I'd like you to send me a signed copy, please. <laughs> I will. And I hope your readers in your book group um, enjoy it. Um, I'm, I'm you know. sure they will. And, and please do come and see us in Tring. We're just a I little love shop Tring. that's only been open for less than a year now. And we had a book festival in November last year um, that we're hoping to repeat this year if we're all allowed out. Who knows? Um, but, but we would love to see you sometime in Tring. I'd love to come and I can't wait for a moment when that's possible again. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you so much to Beth for um, agreeing to be interviewed and thank you to Kim as well for her involvement. Um, as I mentioned and Kim mentioned, uh, this is going to be our first book club book. So to, do please get involved and, uh, and we'll be uh, meeting up on, on the internet somewhere soon um, to discuss this wonderful book. Um, how do you get hold of it? So simply give us a call uh, 01442 827 653. Um, or indeed any of your independent shops if, uh, if you um, live further afield. And, uh, and you can go on our website, which is Tring Book Festival, 
www.bookshop.co.uk and go to the bookshop page. So um, thank you once again. It was a, a, a fascinating conversation uh, with Beth. You know, it's very hard to get um, uh, published as a debut novelist and she gave some insight into that. So it's wonderful. Thank you again and we've got more to come. So uh, watch this space. <laughs>